Good. November 16th, 2023, it is 7.31 p.m. Uh, yeah, I'm going by a uh, rep, rep standard. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, let's do a roll call. Director Decker? Here. Director Saki? Here. Director Slater Carter? Present. Director Young? Present. Thank you. And Director Boyd is present. So all present and accounted for. Uh, for President's statement, uh, I think I'm just going to keep it really short. I'm going to thank Clemens and the staff and uh, our friends at the uh, Cabrillo Unified School District uh, for working to get water to the water situation sorted out at Carolina View. Um, I think we're in a better position now to stay in, in contact and be able to avoid some of these things going forward, but uh, I really appreciate the work that Clemens and others did to look into the problem and then work so hard to get people to so they could understand what needed to happen and put us all in a better position with respect to uh, prevention for contamination in the system. It was, uh, it was kind of urgently done, and that's always hard to do well, um, but uh, a lot of that is behind us now. So <laughs> thank you for everyone who stepped up and uh, helped get the problem resolved. All right. Do we have any oral comments for items that are not on the agenda? I'm not seeing anyone on Zoom. No one in the boardroom. Uh, just so, Captain Bay has a structural deficit. Um, I heard four million, but Bill said it was five million. Peter. Peter. Peter, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I didn't say anything. I know. I'm so sorry. I've done it to you twice. I called you Peter earlier. You called me both. Early Alzheimer's. <laughs> okay. So. All right. Uh, just thank you. We win the lawsuit. <laughs> Let's uh, let's go to old business uh, item number one. This is to review the Alta Vista groundwater monitoring update. Yeah, thanks, uh, Scott. So we started uh, this item actually at the last meeting, but uh, we know this is something that um, Mark Boisner would like to go a little bit into the detail. Um, and I think the board deserves to hear uh, once a year or each other year we bring an update to the board. Um, about our well monitoring program up in the Alta Vista area. And uh, I, I think it's important to understand what is actually happening in the aquifer. And um, we, we were, so we were required to uh, implement a monitoring program at the very beginning when we asked for permission to uh, pump the well from the Coast Commission. And um, we uh, also thought that this was a very good idea and uh, suggested that actually to uh, the Coastal Commission and are now, uh, so we were required to do this for five years, but here we are 20 years after, yeah. 20 years after, and uh, are still looking at learning more about um, the uh, I'm going to just call it a, 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 an aquifer that's essentially in the granitic, granitic portion of Montera Mountain. I'm just going to hand it over to Mark Voichner with Balanced Hydrologic, our um, um, hydro, hydrogeologists uh, that help us with uh, all things um, related to water in the underground in this area. Uh, they have tremendous expertise in uh, the Bay Area on the coast side. So um, actually that was a presentation that uh, Mark put together um, and, and uh, this was shared with the uh, Groundwater Resources Association. Uh, in, it's a California Groundwater Resources Association and that was in October. So Mark, just handing it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Clemens, and glad to see, happy to see everybody. Uh, I will share my desktop and show the PowerPoint, um, which was presented at this uh, at this Western Groundwater Congress, uh, the GRA. And let's see. So it um, the there we go. 
how does that look? Um, we can see your screen, but okay, good. Like you're still scrolling to. Um, yeah, let's let's. Okay. I was I was uh, calling up a few things here, and let me just get this uh, organized. Yep, looks good, Mark. Okay, very good. Um, so yeah, this was presented in in uh, uh, this this year, and it's an up, update of uh, uh, basically the Alta Vista well. Um, because that is a high, a very high yielding, um, a very unique uh, uh, high yielding um, uh, well within a fractured groundwater system, um, and it's 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 very unique. And just wanted to um, go through some of this. And as Clement says, it was drilled in in twenty um, two thousand four. And uh, these 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 names are just a few of the the names that uh, there's there's there are many, many other people that were involved in, including the board there, George Irving at the beginning, and uh, of course Ka Catherine and uh, Scott and and Paul too. Um, and, and and I do I I got to thinking from the last time one of the last meetings that I had with Paul. Um, he he asked the question, um, "Are you know this this is a deep uh, deep deep well in in the fractured granite?" And he asked the question, um, "Is the well are 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 we mining groundwater? Uh, you know, like like you hear about in the news down in Arizona and some parts of California, Central Valley, are are, are we mining old groundwater? Um, and and the, how how long is this well going to last?" Uh, because it's quite um, common for um, fractured wells and fractured um, bedrock to to be overpumped, and 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 um, when you overpump a fracture, it, it tends to dry out, and then you have to wait for it to recharge. Um, so, so this the the title uh, sustainable management of a fractured groundwater aquifer is, is I, I'd like to joke about it a little bit Earth Earth think of it in a humorous way as being a an oxymoron or or, or, or paradox um, uh, because the, the 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 general understanding of, of fracture wells are 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 not sustainable um, or, or or can or it's difficult to be sustainable pumping a, a fractured system and in fact the um water board requires i'm going to bring this point up when when you add a source well to your to a public water system the, the um water board requires um much much uh, more stringent uh, requirements uh testing requirements um for uh, a well in a fractured bedrock system then um, for for a standard or not standard, but a a, a usual um, alluvial basin. Um, so, it, so with with that in mind, you know, and and it was it was a good question Paul had. Um, how do we know uh, we're pumping it at a sustainable rate? Um, and uh, we we look at this by with many with with various um, um, lines of, of evidence or, or, or lines of reasoning um, and and these these are not necessarily ranked in in order of importance but you could think of it more of a circle um, you know certainly understanding the geologic framework is is one of the most important things and and understanding the hydrologic um, response to the aquifer when you pump it, uh, but there there are other 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 ways of looking at the the uh, the aquifer and the in the pumping that are are independent of of the, you know the standard um, um, uh, uh, understanding of the aquifer. Um, so yeah, so we have these we look at at these different. Um, perspectives, um, understanding the geologic framework, the fracture orientation and the boundaries of, of the fractures, um, hyd hydrologic monitoring, and it's important to monitor across a, um, a major recharge 
year or years and then across throughout years to understand how the, the system um, uh, re re recovers from from a, a dry period and and what what are the limits during a, a multi years of drought the the pumping limits um, you can look at the general minerals uh, the, the the salt contents that's um, that's that's useful for for different uh, purposes Ma mainly when you're on the coast it's it's a good way of of fingerprinting uh, the source of groundwater and if it's if it's being impacted by seawater intrusion is an important one and you, you can see that with the general minerals uh, chloride and uh, sodium mainly um, and then there are some groundwater aging techniques um, and these are uh, these each there there are various methods of of dating groundwater, and when, when we say date groundwater, we're looking at how how long has it been in in the aquifer since recharge, and we basically th there are two um, uh, groups. Um, there's there's modern water, and there's different techniques to to date modern water, and then there's pre modern water. So um, modern water. And I'll, I'll I'll get to those definitions a little bit uh, a little bit um, a lot along the way here, uh, but we're we're just looking at you know those two basic if if it's a modern water and then you have a well that's being recharged um, with with recent uh, wet years, then you should have modern water and and if you're you're drawing more pre modern water which is hundreds to thousands of, year, of years old, then then you're you have to raise the question you know where where's how how long is that older water or the pre-modern water gonna gonna last because we, we we really want to pump a sustainable pumping rate as is um is eventually the the well will will draw in mostly if not all um modern water um which is recently recharged um there's some modeling and um you, you can the next step would be groundwater modeling or it, it, it could be as simple as water balances and recharge area estimates that's that's where and, and then you could take it to uh, computer mod modeling uh we, we haven't done that just done some basic calculations um of of, of how how water flows in the aquifer and then there's some historical records um and in your area, there aren't, you know, the historical records is more of a folklore, you know, more of a folk perspective is, you know, you're, you're, you're pumping a, you're pumping a um, fracture system and you're likely going to run out of water. That's sort of like the, the folklore of, of pumping uh, fractured aquifers. Um, but and and then looking further back, uh, you could look into indigenous traditions and and how they, um, uh, how how they approached uh, what water resources, and and other resources. Um, most mostly, um, a lot of those traditions come from gathering, hunting, and gathering, and and how to manage uh, their food systems. Um, so this uh, let me say something about your your mountain your aquifer um, montera mountain um what's unique about this mountain uh there's two two things that are unique here one is is that it's a non-glaciated uh, deeply weathered granitic rock and and this promotes uh recharge you know you have deep soils um permeable soils that promotes recharge and also promotes storage and sustains base flows. So a, a lot of the um, streams, as you know, um, have perennial flows year round. And that's, that has to do with um, this, this high, high rate of recharge and storage um, in granitic, in, in the uh, deeply weathered granites. The other thing that's unique is that uh, if you look at this map on the left, um, this is a map mainly of 
the selenian block which is a a, a block uh a, a basement block um and and it's a granitic your your basement rock in in this in in this block is is granitic and these red splotches are where the basement rock the granitic basement basement rock is found at the surface um and th and then th th this this block is is bordered or bounded by by faults um notably the san andreas fault on on the east and the um um san gregorio seal cove fault on on the west and what's what's really unique about um montero mountain is it's at this at this junction where these two faults are converging um and and the, these are two major you know you know san andreas fault is probably one of the more is, is probably one it probably is the longest fault in uh, on earth um and mm -hmm and uh or one of them uh I'd, I'd have to kind of look into that but it, it is a it, both these faults are are converging at the, right where mount montero mountain has uh thrust it upward so it's it's gone under a lot of tectonic stress and thrust and which and twisting and and fracturing so so it's highly fractured and it's also deeply weathered and um non-glaciated and that's those are all unique. And in a couple of pictures here, you can see that this is. Um, can can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the well. Um, this is your your treatment plant. Um, Montero Creek is flows out this way, and this is Daffodil Canyon. And the the well is, sits nicely up on top of this ridge, and and um, and these valleys where we talked about the the sea level rising since the last glacial maxima um, and that's oops sorry this is uh so this is an example of the deeply weathered you know there's there's out here at montera there's the the um the half moon bay uh, uh, terrace aquifer which is um the, the marine terrace and that and then there's alluvium in the in, in the stream valleys that's uh, backed up and it's um accumulated sediment and then there's colluvial wedges um and and this whole area is is um um is your recharge area this this is where rainfall um recharges your aquifer um this is a cross section um, of 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 what we're just looking at um, down here at Pacific Ocean, the Marine Terrace, um, deeply weathered granites, um, the fractured granite, um, and the uh, all alluvial um, channels. Um, what's unique here? So this shows where the Alta Vista well is, and this is a segment, this lower segment of um, what's called an acoustic televiewer, and this is a mapping of of the inside. If if you think of the the wall of of the uh, the the uh, the well, the the well, the well. By the way, I'll back up here for a second. The well is is an open um, borehole. And the upper portion is cased and sealed, so you have a very deep, three, like 360 foot seal to that well. It seals off um, this upper perched, weathered granitic um, aquifer, and it draws um, mainly, if if not exclusively, from um, two main faults, uh, two main uh, fractures or joints down um, at the bottom of the well, um, 600, 725 feet down. And this this is an image of those faults, of, of those uh, openings. Um, the two main sort, the two main openings that supply uh, groundwater to the well. Um, and so this acoustic televiewer is a, a way to map the inside of the, the borehole. Um, and if if you Im imagine rolling out a tube, and 
uh, up here it says north, east, south, west, and north. So the north, um, it's it's completely ruled out. And, and where you see a, an S shape, like this down here, the and where you see these darker openings, um, this is where um, this is where there's a fracture. And where where it's it's light colored, you, this yellow is where there's higher velocities. And you, you think think of it like a um, like a, a bat. Uh, or or a dolphin um try uh listening to uh, and and where where the you get a strong echo is where there's solid rock and um no fracture and where there's a fracture it gets you have a slower echo and and so this maps the the fractures and <clears throat> the two main fractures is a two foot opening uh at seven 24 or whatever it might be and then there's a, a one foot opening and then there there are multiple uh, fractures in there and when drilling with air air rotary uh it it uh, when when the drill rig uh penetrated those fractures it just blew up a bunch of of, of water and we, we knew there was uh, some kind of a source there um yeah feel free to ask questions um if uh if if needed what what uh on that last slide that oh. water was that the water coming out when you drill like we were drilling yes it went, as, soon as, as soon as the drill rig entered this um this region um see it's it's lifting cuttings from from the borehole with with compressed air and you know it's just kind of piling up at at, at the uh at the at the top of at the ground surface right at the hole and then when intersected these water bearing you know open joints this is basically you could think of it as a thrust fault too it, it's either an open joint or some kind of a thrust fault that's that, that's dipping into the mountain and they're they're imaged here um, um yeah so it's it's just a uh what i wanted to say too is that those the source of water is below sea level that's this black line here, and that's important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, well, it seems like you've shown that the source of water is partly above sea level and partly below sea level, which would make me think your second question of how the hydrologic balance works and how much seawater versus rainwater we should expect to recharge. I'm, I'm dying to hear that part, because so okay. far, a scientist, I love it. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're right that these fractures are um, these are these are deep fractures, and they're they're striking. Um, the the biggest one here is striking almost due north. Um, and even though it's deep, it gets recharged. So you start pumping it, and it, and it forms. You know, this you probably heard a cone of depression. It it, it pulls down the water and it 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 brings in um so there's water naturally percolating and, and flowing this way but it, it it does percolate down and um that's that's a, st a sustainable part of it um yeah and we'll talk about sea level intrusion um so the geologic framework this is just a I'm going to breeze through this. You stop with any questions. Um, each each one of these techniques are um, are are a way of to, to understand how those fractures work. And a, a lot of it was before we drilled the well. And a, as we drill, if you remember, there was we were on a drilling campaign of, and we selected twelve drill sites, and we were marching down uh, one, two, three, four, and then the Alta Vista well is the fourth one, and it turned out uh, pretty good. But uh, with each yeah. well, there's um, there's uh, Mark, Mark, yes. Go I ahead. Interrupt. If you could give a little bit of history, because there are people who were not paying close attention um, or unable to in when we were on this drilling campaign, and so they don't realize how many what our test framework was and we had yes. failure wells in addition to this so i think it's important for people to realize what a 
phenomenal <laughs> effort Balance and Montero put into locating as well. Uh, yes, that is a uh, excellent question, um, and it it's a whole nother story. <laughs> I mean, it, it's 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 a it's a really uh, great story, um, and. Uh, I'm trying to think of a way to to quickly. Um, I mean, to not get caught up too, uh, too how many, deep how into many that. Tests, how many the, tests the, did we drill? If if you remember from last time, I, I have it pulled up. Um, so th this was back in in early 2000s, and and I mentioned last time that um, you know DWR and everybody was everybody was pointing to. Um, the the aquifer, the airport aquifer, which is the Half Moon Bay. This this whole area is the Half Moon Bay um, Terrace Aquifer, if you remember. And the airport aquifer is a main uh, a main part of that uh, for for you. Um, but there is also this Ocean Bee Farms area that a lot of people are pointing at. Um, you know, as as a ob obvious um, assumption there starting point um so that's where we started uh, we started we 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 mapped out or we selected um these different sites See, these were 12 sites that we ended up selecting but there were many others we we're looking at, at at the time if you remember you you had just bought the system and um it's it's like buying an old broken down car that, that was misused for, for a long time. And so it really needed to be o overhauled. And, and not not only the sources, but, you know, as you all know, the the, the pipes and, and uh, storage and everything. But um, so we, we were looking at a lot of different sources. I mean, if everything from, you know, um, the, you know, Montero Creek. Let's see if I can get the creeks in here. Make it close. Um, San Vicente, you know, this, this upper part, there's, there's, uh, there's a ranch up there we're looking at to trying to work out something. Anyway, and we settled on these four, um, 12 different um, sites that we ended up, and went through an um, extensive CEQA permitting. It was, it was kind of amazing that they asked for that, but it, it went through a CEQA permitting for each one of the each one of these sites had to have a biological assessment, and um, at, at at the time this was um, not not owned by the um, by the Park Service, the federal. Uh, it was um, oh, I forget the name of that. Anyway, um, the, they are um, so each one of these sites were were. Um, um, Evaluated for for habitat and impacts, the drilling impacts, and it was a, it was a, a regular CEQA uh, EIR um, to 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 look at all these, and so we started we started with number one, no, number two didn't work out too well because of the um, the, the horse pasture is a little bit too close to the hat. Number three, uh, these are both um, these are monitoring wells now, but they're they're both useful uh, wells. Um, this one in particular, it's at the mouth of um, of uh, Daffodil Canyon. Uh, these three were not drilled. These four, one, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven. Um, they they were on deck to to be drilled. Especially seven was kind of interesting. This this, this particular area has uh, a lot of high yielding wells, and that's that's a whole other report we did. We looked at all all the wells in the area and, and ranked all of the highest yielding wells and the lowest yielding wells, and kind of just a, a general picture of, of where where um, yield uh, uh, was ha, has been found. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we started with, and then we went up. Um, I'll turn off these and get back to the presentation. Thank uh, you, Mark. Yeah. It wasn't just a, a a lucky drilling that got us this well. We went through a lot of work and a lot of money to get to the well we got. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. And this explains uh, a little bit how we got there. Um, this part of it, 
So there's there's good geologic mapping um, of the area. These are the faults. This is the um, the terrace aquifer. This is green as the granite. These, these are the uh, Montero. This is like Montero yeah. Creek and alluvium in in the in the in the colluvium. These these are all slides. You know these black Let's dots. What's it? Yeah, go ahead. I can't see your cursor. Oh, yeah. It's does that come out now? Um, I can see it red. Oh, now I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, I I should probably find a way to make it bigger or maybe a colorful or there there might be a way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, so there's geologic mapping. What's important at the top of the mountain here? There are these fracture orientation outcrops and th those are very useful so if you notice there's a north then that um kind of like a, a star or an asterisk um and that comes in interest interesting because the the stream the stream channels generally follow these fracture orientations and we, we used a lot of that um with aerial photo interpretation and looking at um, a ground truthing a, a lot of these fractures and um, and lining up those 12 um, well sites with with these fractures that, and with the, the way the creeks um, followed the fracturing. Um, and when we drill a well, uh, we log the we we do we geologically log that we we log the 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 sediment that's coming up in in the mineralogy then there's do a geo, geophysical um logs of of each hole and th this last one here is the acoustic televiewer um uh log where this is the upper portion uh, which is the weathered portion which is the fracture and weathering which most most of the domestic wells are pulled groundwater from this um I, I call it a perched because it's perched on top of solid um solid sections and this the the more yellow it is the more competent the the rock is and in fact as we we're drilling um can you see my cursor here what do you mean by competent a co competent is just that the 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 rock is more solid and not not weathered the the, the weathering zone uh, we interpret it here as um, by this color here, and then this red and and polka dotted um, pattern is is uh, less. It, it it becomes less weather, a non weathered. Um, yeah, yeah, my cursor disappears. Sometimes it becomes non weather. What's what's the significance of the orange on the map right. at the left of that screen? The, the orange on the map is over here, or at the left? Yeah, the right left here? of the screen. There, there's there's sh shades of orange on the map at the left. Um, oh, over here. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what is that shade of orange your cursor is on right now? What is okay, that? Okay. Yeah. So this is this is this is Marine Terrace Q QMT, um, and and that's that's. Um, that's recent marine terrace deposits. That's that's the that's what's called the Half Moon Bay Terrace Aquifer, and that's and, that's, and does the soil in Moss Beach have the same properties as the high permeability and good storage and retention as what we're getting close to the mountain? Um, the 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 Terrace Aquifer is a, a marine deposit, and it's 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 variable. Um, there, there, there are. Um, high, it's, it really depends if you're intersecting a, a gravelly zone or a, a, a clay or fine grain material. It, is it there really more varies. salt water intrusion over closer to Seal Cove because it's near the ocean? In the in the uh, airport aquifer, you have salt water intrusion there. Um, yeah, well, I can show you a plot like that. There is no salt water intrusion. In, in in your area, Good. there's a, absolutely no uh, saltwater intrusion. In fact, it's not 100 percent true, Mark. Oh, we have, okay. We have knowledge of uh, some saltwater intrusion in the Montero Beach area. Mm -hmm. There is some wells on Second Street that have elevated salinities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, I'm, I'm not aware of that. What, what, what I'm aware of is, um, yeah, there is on Second Street, there is, um, th there is actually some, um, see this, there is other deposits. And, and in fact, there's some oil too. There's some petroleum and um, the Parisma, I, I believe the Parisma outcrops over there. Do I, I see it on here? But there, there are those petroleum wells, and some of that salt might be um, related to the um, the deposit and, and not intruded by sea seawater. Um, Mark, there's a question from Bill. Yeah, the fact. So this is a super cool analysis because it's exactly what we need to know, which is where are we getting our water from, and what might it be in danger from, and how does it work? But this last question that there are wells on second street that you don't know about. Well, if we as a water district are going to know what's happening in the aquifer, we in principle ought to know about all of the wells anywhere near here. And it isn't necessarily a question for you, but it seems to me that the best way for us to do our job here, listening to you and in understanding how to incorporate it would be to include information from every well we possibly have access to. I do not administratively know how that can happen, but scientifically, I know I would like it to happen. Right. Let me just mention that Clemens does have this knowledge, and it's the one who raised the point. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, on the time will sync up with Mark. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, yeah. Let me just. I would in. question whether, whether it's the, actually seawater intrusion. Um, un unless there's something very, very local that some somebody is over pumping a well at, at very close to the ocean, that th that would be the only um, very localized intrusion. What what, what I do know um, that there's um, like especially the airport aquifer area area, there's upwelling groundwater, and and um, there we have here. Without Mark, getting into Mark, let me let's just interject real quick and answer Bill's question. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, all right, so we don't have jurisdiction over private wells in Thank this you. area. It's Cemetery County Health Department that issued right. the permits that um, has all the records uh, or, or uh, should have all the records, uh, but um, it has been very difficult to get uh, any information about these wells. What we are particularly interested in is actually extraction data, and that is something that is measured by Cemetery County. Every well has to have a meter on it. Unfortunately, there is no information or data available whatsoever, so that's the problem. The information that I'm, where I'm getting this information essentially secondhand from local plumbers that are servicing these wells. How do we fix that? We are a public health agency. They are also a public health agency. Hold on, hold, hold on. Private property. You're, 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 right. now, you're now delving into business. Yeah. We're still receiving Mark's report. It's off topic. So hold. It's on topic. Like no, it's 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 spurred by the topic. And let's save it for business time later. We're receiving a report okay. right now. Mark, I have one other question. A, a, probably a decade or more ago. San Mateo County wanted to do a groundwater study, but they couldn't get any participants of domestic wells to offer up their information. Do you know if they've ever done one since then? Um, that that was in two thousand nine, and Balance did that report. We we right. there there are several um, wells. Uh, they there was it was during the drought, and they wanted to look at closer. and And there 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 were many people that that offered their well. And, and we we instrumented them with uh, with with level loggers and thank you and thank you. monitored it. But I did want to mention um, about the seawater intrusion. So you have a, a lot of this mountain is it has a lot of head um, groundwater head, and when they drilled the pilings for for the uh, the marina out here, the new ones they 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 had upwelling fresh water out yeah. out, out here. Um, huh. There's there's piezometer there's a piezometer nest over here in the marsh that's that's ver that's upwelling there's there's fresh water coming up, uh, in into the marsh there's off there's a, along this is the seal coat fault, and 
this is a pier and then on on the on the west side of the seal cove fault this is um uh a prisma uh a bedrock and and this is a the airport aquifer and what's happening is like this this fault is acting as a barrier to this aquifer and and a lot and all the recharge and and groundwater flow that comes through comes down through Denniston Creek and this upper portion is a lot of recharge up in here. It it ends up upwelling along the fault. Um, and and there's there are wells out here during the wet season that are artesian. You can see them um, and, and you can measure them um, with with water coming up. So that all that prevents um, seawater intrusion. Uh, that that kind of a you would have to um, hmm. And the other thing is with regard getting back to the talk and and I have a, a graph here we we can plot the water levels on this this well this well and these other wells and there is um, there's still a there's a coastal gradient I, I can pull in fact I have it right here um, let me see if I can I think I have it right there's a coastal gradient. Um, it's one of these um, that basically answers that question. Yeah. So here's the Alta Vista well. These, these are different years um, of measurement. And this is the ground surface. This is the beach. Um, and these here. So there's there's um, there's a coastal gradient. And this, this gradient makes seawater intrusion impossible. Um, across this profile you you would, in order to get seawater intrusion you have to reverse the gradient like like you see in uh, like the Pajaro Valley and Salinas Valley where, where the the valley is being over pumped and and there's a reversal of, of this gradient um, so that that's that's why I, I said I, um, I there's there's, mm -hmm. there's no seawater intrusion in your area from from pumping your wells um, anyway, um, back to the um, they they here. So that's what we're doing. We're you know ground truth thing, you know drilling wells, and then um, looking at the the fracturing. The next step, you you can take all of these fractures, and so each one of these S shapes. Um, if you remember, this is north, 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 east, south, west, north, rolled out. You can, if it forms an S, that means the fracture is dipping. Um, if it's if it were straight, it's it's not dipping. And, and the steeper the S, the the bigger the S um, wave to it, then the the steeper the the dip. And and you you can plot all those. This is this is pretty fancy. I'm not going to get. I, I don't want to bore you too much about this, but this is really a, a cool way of, of plotting. Each one of these points is is a fracture from from this um, from the Alta Vista borehole, and uh, and the, the the one main two foot open joint uh, that is plotted right here. And what this is this is this is a plot of the pole to the plane. Um, so so the Alta Vista that that two foot open joint. Or thrust fault um, strikes almost north south three three three, de three, three degrees off the of north, and it's dipping. It's a high. It, it's dipping at a um, at a, a f at, at fifty eight degrees, um, and and so if you draw a a pole perpendicular from this plane, it 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 can be plotted in a sphere. And then project it on on on, on a flat uh, uh, two two eventually uh, right here. Uh, so you know you don't have to get too much of detail, but what you need to know is each one of these points is a fracture, and and you you can oops sorry you you can take you can contour those fractures showing the peaks where where the concentrations of the the fractures and then and then plot each so this is the pole to the plane and this is a strike and this is the dip if if it's steeply dipping it'll come out this far if it's if it's um 
not if it's horizontal it'll, it'll be close to the center and so the, the each one of these contours or these hills are are a concentration of fractures and if you look at how this like this this concentration is is striking um uh, striking um southwest right and it it strikes the same direction as the streams <laughs> So it's it's basically showing it's kind of doing full circle. You're you're showing how the streams are following the the concentrations of of fracturing. This is like for you see my cursor it disappears. So there's this this direction is the same direction as as this concentration. If you were to plot this concentration, it would be like it would be this direction and so on. That that's that's sort of. How, how how we learn with each well we drill, we, we can interpret the fracturing of the well and understand better um, at depth um, the the, uh, for the the fracture network. Um, anyway, that's that's a pretty um, in, in depth um, geophysical method, which is which is a lot of fun. Um, and so when, when you pump the well, you get into pumping, we, we do pumping tests and uh, you, you can in, interpret um, permeabilities and, and boundaries by, by the way these, these curves um, draw down. Um, so moving on. Um, so that's, that's all about interpreting the aquifer properties so what happens when you pump the well is is interpreted through monitoring the um the rainfall you have to uh, monitoring the rainfall it's important to monitor across a recharge of a, a cycle of major recharges in drought years um, monitoring rainfall stream flow the, the stream flow around the areas you know uh, montero creek um, daffodil canyon and martini creek are the three main streams um, shallow groundwater alluvium um, within those um, close to the well and close to the creeks, deep groundwater. And then we, we applied it in, in the CEQA analysis, we applied, uh, we, we adapted these guidelines that were, um, that were developed in the Carmel Valley by McNeese back in the 80s. And, and they, they ran into trouble when they over pumped their, um, their wells and pulled down the groundwater below the root zone of the riparian. The riparian died off during the drought. And mm -hmm. then uh, in 19, 1982, 83, wet years came, high flows eroded the banks and and caused a lot of uh, damage and 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 fear uh, for for homeowners. So that's and and so they they went through a, a very um, rigorous um, monitoring of how how riparian responds to drawdown uh, well uh, of of wells uh, near, nearby uh, and uh, you know if everything from biological color um, vigor um, osmotic pressure of of the leaves how that changed um, very 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 good work and so we we took those guidelines and then they 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 developed guidelines drawdown guidelines to um to mitigate um impacts to riparian and, and so we, we thought it was a good idea to to apply that if, even though they're very um, conservative for your area um because of the of the deeply weathered soils and and the uh the, the distance of the wells from the from the riparian um and I'll, I'll, we we could take a take a look at a plot like that. So so when those there, there are these thresholds, drawdown thresholds that um, if if it during a given year if you go below that threshold, it's sort of like a, a yellow flag. Uh oh, let's let's take a look a little closer at what's going on here. Um, and so this is what's this is a this is a record uh, of rainfall and your your annual pumping uh, total. And and uh, so this mean mean this is the uh, percent of mean uh, rainfall for the year, 
like a 100% would be an average year. If it's above 100, the blue is is the rainfall. So if it's, a, if it's above 100, it's a wet year. If it's a below 100, it's a, it's a drier year. And that this the extreme dry years are like down here below 60. Um, that 2014 is one. That, that's a key uh, one to note. Um, uh, 20, 2018, 2020, and 2021, these are all extreme dry years. Wet years, 2017, 2010 and 11, and 2006 was, uh, five and six were very wet years. The orange uh, columns are your pumping rate, the, your, your total pumping rate in gallons per minute. Uh, it would take the, the total acre feet for the year and then uh, 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 express that as gallons per minute of c continuous pumping rate. And uh, so you, um, and, and so what's important here is that during uh, 2013 and 2014, the pumping rate in Alta Vista well basically doubled uh, in earth and nearly doubled. And then this is, this is about double this, this baseline of 60 gallons a minute. And this was, an uh, interesting year because you're really pushing the limit during an extreme dry year. You, you're pumping more than you have in in, in other years, so um, that was is an important one to to check um, the monitoring records and what happened during that year. And then what happened during a year when you drop back down to lower pumping, um, and then you get a, a major recharge year. Well, I'm I'm not sure I see the recharge. <clears throat> I don't see uh, a water level in well, there. You're, 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 you're not. I'm I'm just saying right. a recharge year because it's a wet. The blue, the the tall blue columns are the, uh, the oh, wet okay. years, and Please. and and during wet years, you get more recharge. Okay. Um, because you have a longer season. Uh, there's more rain, and there's a longer season, and there's there's more opportunity for for groundwater to to reach those deeper fractures. And Mark, you mentioned a yellow flag. Is that like in the year 2020 where the two bars are almost equal? You don't want to have too many years where the orange bar is taller than the blue bar, right? Well, it it's uh, well, that's um, it. It doesn't. Um, I, I th that's not a yellow year. Um, a yellow flag. Okay. Um, the yellow flag would be what are the. Um, Mo the responses what, what what are the monitoring data saying mm -hmm. th th this is just showing what what this is the um condition this, mm -hmm. this is showing the the condition what what is the response to this there are yeah, two, there's two yeah. variables here there's rainfall and then there's pumping mm -hmm. and and so it, it, it this may not be a bad we we don't know um this is this is taller than its dry year, and you're you're constantly shuffling different sources. You have many wells. You're shuffling one well might be down. The Portola well might be down, and so you're pumping more from Alta Vista or whatever it might be. And th this has happened to be a year, uh, 2014. You had to pump a little bit more well, because because of other uh, other conditions, and it turned out to be a, a an extreme dry year. So, so let, Mark, just just a clarification. Yeah, go ahead. The average pumping rate we're looking at the average pumping rate for alta vista well oh it's not the whole district no it's just just the alta vista well only okay thank you all right so it it seems to me the one missing graph which would resolve everything would be the ground would uh essentially the groundwater level for each of these years so now we could see if the groundwater level is going up or down according to how much we pumped and how much rain we got in any given year that I would love to see. Bingo. I can't see the the words on this, so I just see. Yeah, you're 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 right on cue. Um, that's exactly what the the res this shows the response. There's a lot of lines here, and um, don't get too alarmed. Um, it, it shows a lot of what's going on. So what's important here, a baseline is this blue line, which is the Alta Vista water level elevation, and then this yellow line, which is the pumping rate. 
and the elevation is on this on this x y axis and the pump production rate in gpm is on this side and these are different years um we started pumping and it was drilled in 20 2004 uh started pumping in tw at the end of 20 uh, 2007 um and so each one of these is a water year across the x-axis and there are the different colors these are um the type of water years expressed in both color and percent so it's a blue this is like a, a wet year um the tw 2005 and six are blue and then you have three dry years um this is more of a, a normal year um then 2011 was a a wet year so these are both kind of wet years this is more wet uh the, it's got blue um then we go into a dry sequence, uh, 2012, 13, 14 is, a, is two dry years and an extreme dry year, 2014. Um, another dry year, then a normal year, and then a wet year. So then there, then we get to and then these wet years are the major recharge years. Then we go into another sequence of dry years. And so this is why it's important to monitor across um, these cycles of, of wet and dry years. 22, is, so then we, we return back to a normal year and then 2023 20, is a wet year. Um, so if you go back to this blue line is the, the drawdown in the in the Alta Vista well. And it reached its lowest level in 2014. And, and that was you remember for the bar chart that that's this yellow line at when you had at 2013 and 14 you uh, you had the pump Alta Vista well a little bit more, actually double um, the, the rate, the rate uh, up to a double, um, and then and then you drop down and and back down to this this lower this uh, more baseline level, and so the drawdown did in the well uh, responded to pumping, got to its lowest level during 2014, and then um, that's what I meant about the 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 yellow flag is well what's happening to the wells near the um, the creek. This is MW1, MW2, are those two wells near the creek. And those are, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just quickly show remind you where those are uh, because they're important. They're important because, um, so we're over here, the Alta Vista well. And, you know, there, this this North Fork of Montero Creek has a um, riparian for, uh, forest uh, a thicket yeah. in, in here. It's a spring. There's a spring here in riparian zone. And there's a monitoring well, monitoring well one is next to Montero Creek on the up gradient side of this of this wetland or this this riparian area. And then MW2 is on the down gradient side of this riparian area, both next to the creek, both shallow monitoring wells in the alluvium. Um, and so when these, and we're going back to that McNeese criteria, um, when when these, um, so this these are the two that we're watching for responses to the riparian. And, and the creek level. The last thing we want is to uh, for this riparian to die off. Um, and so then there's some deeper wells. This uh, 2004, five is three and five. These two wells are are wells in the granitic, and they're they respond to uh, they're they're connected to the uh, fracturing of of the uh, the underlying granite. These two wells are in the alluvium, um, and so that's an important um, understanding. And you call those two monitoring wells. We're not pumping water out of them. We're just using them to monitor to, to the monitor water. the water level. the The only well being pumped is the Alta Vista well. So and so in this area. And you mentioned like you have to make a response when you notice, you know, a yellow flag. Uh, situation what response do we make yeah let's uh well the response to the pumping the the response of the aquifer to the pumping that's that's what i mean by response how 
how is the aquifer, the fractures, and and the water levels and the stream flow, all the, all these monitoring parameters, how are they responding to pumping? They're also responding to um, rainfall, uh, and 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 other pumping. There's there's other other sources in here. Um, they're responding to land use, you know, and but um, but we want to uh, understand what the pumping is is doing. And we can do it going back to the uh, the chart. Uh, let me just interject here, Mark. Yeah, I'm just trying to answer Sid's question a little better. So what what we can do in response is this: we're looking at one source of the district, right? We have many other sources. We have other wells in the surface uh, water treatment plant, okay, and so where we're trying to get to, and this is not necessarily a one year event, but is uh, essentially we can we can use the Alta Vista well in a drought scenario. Uh, but when we are in a wet scenario, we are essentially trying to ensure that the aquifer can recharge and we can use other sources. So both in drought times, as well as in, in, in wet times, we can make choices on which sources are being pumped at what times, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, maintain a healthy aquifer uh, for all scenarios that way. Throughout the district, not just with also this. Okay, yes. thank you. Yeah. If I, if I can add, Mark, you can talk about, not now, but I know there are lots of, of stories and science papers on aquifers that have been collapsed and are now unable to recharge. And so management of the ground in the aquifer is important for keeping our groundwater healthy. Yes. And 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 remind you that the reason why we're putting all this effort in the Alta Vista well is because it, if you remember the those open the two foot open, I mean it's it's almost unheard of a, a two foot open fracture or joint or thrust fault that this well is intersecting, and it's capable of of pumping hundreds of gallons a minute if you wanted to um but uh, but that's not sustainable and, and and that's what we're looking at here what what is a su sustainable rate for a well that potentially could pump short term hundreds of gallons a minute we we, we pumped to 300 gallons a minute for for um like a three i think it was a three-day pump test five-day pump test um and it it can pump more, and so you you think, oh wow, we're 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 in the uh, the the um, we're we're good, you know. Let, let's 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 pump it, and but the, but what really happens? That's what I mean. How how does things respond to um, to the, to pumping, and what what is a state sustainable rate for for such a well? To that point, the, the questions, ever since I saw this graph, which is wonderful, this is exactly the kind of data I love to see. There's two things that you haven't mentioned that seem to be evident just in the graph of the sort of the green-yellow lines doing kind of the opposite of the blue lines on the bottom of the graph, where the faster you pump it, the lower the water level goes, and then vice versa. One is how fast it happens. There's clearly an anti-correlation where if the pump level goes up, the water level goes down. And it looks like it probably takes a few days or a week or something. But I'm sure that if you did an autocorrelation or a cross-correlation graph, it would be obvious exactly what the time delay is from pumping to um, groundwater shift. <clears throat> yeah. And the other is how much the average rate at which we can do that depends on rainfall. So it's not just the couple day correlation of pumping versus groundwater, but in a dry year, we're gonna have a harder time pumping out what we got then in a wet year. That is on the graph too, I'm sure of it. I just don't know what the answers are yet because I, I haven't done the data analysis in my head. Yeah, let's let's look at this a little closer. Um, I wanna look, let's look at these uh, three and four 
4-3 and 4-5, sorry, 3 and 5. Um, the, these are those two bedrock wells. Um, in fact, we, we drilled number three first before drilling the Alta Vista well. It's, it's just up the road, like 300 feet, whatever it might be. Um, and it's at the same depth. Uh, it, 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 only, it only did seven gallons a minute. It, hmm. it, 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 it didn't, didn't intersect um, that, that main joint. Um, but after we, uh, you know, sidebar here, af after, if, if you project the, what we learned from the, um, the Alta Vista well geophysics and, and the dip of the, the, that joint, you could probably, if we, if we drilled a couple hundred feet deeper, we, we could have, um, per perhaps in, in our, uh, intersected that joint, but, you know, with, you know, 800 feet uh, already pretty deep for this, and we're, we're only getting seven gallons a minute. Um, in, anyway, so these, if you see here, this, these, the shape of this follows almost directly the shape of the, the pumping. The drawdown in the Alta Vista well shows up as drawdown in those monitoring, in those gr granitic um, deep groundwater um, or monitoring wells. Um, the two shallow wells near the creek are, are responding differently. They they respond to uh, recharge from the creek, and and the creeks uh, and and rainfall, and you see a, a diurn or a annual a seasonal rise. MW one is on the on the high on the up gradient side of that um, that riparian zone, and MW two is on the down gradient. And the you see how. The blue line is, is it doesn't fluctuate as much as the red. It's because of the spring that's coming into the that uh, riparian area, and so and the, and so there is this regular wet season, dry season recession, wet season, dry season recession, and and less so in the down gradient well because of the spring. Mm -hmm. Now during 2014, the extreme drought. Um, so we had a couple years of drought. It was, it was responding similarly, and the the low in each one of those are about the same, whether it's a wet year and a dry year. So they're really responding to to local um, shallow uh, recharge. But in 2014, um, it it broke through the late dry season broke through that 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 threshold of um, that was established here. And this is meant by kind of a yellow flag. You go, okay, well, the groundwater level next to the creek and the riparian and the blue line too, oops, the blue line too um, dropped down um, below this this previous th low threshold. And mm -hmm. so you're saying, okay, well, the water, water level is going below what it used to um, during the, the late dry season. And then uh, 2015, it's also did the same thing. And it, it didn't, it didn't recover uh, until the pumping dropped off. So the pumping dropped off, the, um, I mean, l decreased, and the water level in the Alta Vista well rose. At the same time, we got some wet years. And so this climb or this recharge of the, of the um, bedrock wells is due to both the wet years, but also um, the reduced pumping. And, and it, you can see here where there's no pumping, there's a super wet year here. It would have been good to have some more pump level here. But, but you see this rise in groundwater level during 20, 2006, a super wet year, no pumping. Um, it continued. There's carryover uh, of high high uh, high levels during a dry year. There's this carryover, no pumping again, um, and and so anyway, that's getting back to this 2014. So we're seeing um, this this um, lowering of of water level in near the creek. This is a, a zoomed in of the, of the same thing. This is a zoomed in look of the same thing um, showing 2014 here, 2015. And it, it wasn't until the recharge and reduced groundwater pumping 
that the wire level came back up to this base level. Uh, the same thing happened during 2021, two extreme dry years, and um, but but uh, but recovered um, quickly, even during a normal year. Um, basically, the the pumping level was less. So these are two similar conditions of weather conditions, but this one has more pumping and this one has less pumping. And you can see there's more drawdown. And, and that's that's what I mean by um, kind of a yellow flag. Okay, well, let's, let's take a look at what's going on closer. Um, Something I noticed by looking at that graph is so the rainfall is roughly those red lines on the top, which are dropping down. And the farther they drop down, the less rainfall we got, right? And the uh, no, not line, exactly, but go ahead. And the very red line at the bottom is the water level inside a test well, which is reasonably deep water. So I'm noticing, A, the drops are at the same time. Like in the very middle, there's a very steep drop during those drought years. And yes, indeed, the red line in the very bottom in the deep well is showing a very steep drop at about the same time. The other thing I notice is there seems to be a delay of about a month between when the red line on the very top drops down from rainfall and when the red line on the very bottom, bottom the orange line. You mean? Excuse me. Orange. Are you talking about the orange line? From yeah. where I'm sitting, it looks like red, but maybe. Okay. It's not. Uh, but at any rate, there's a very bottom line from the deep well and the very top line from a rainfall-ish thing on the surface, and it seems like there's a slight delay, maybe a month or so, sideways, left to right so that the rainfall is reflected, not immediately, but reasonably soon in the deep well. That would be wonderful because if we can see rainfall reflected so quickly in deep water, we have a much better indicator of what's going on than if we have to wait years. Yeah, I, 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 I'd have to take closer, we could look at a look closer. I'm, I'm not uh, convinced that uh, if, at, at, at this scale, it's it's hard to to see that i i think um this yeah. red line is is the wire level in the monitoring well next yeah. to the creek uh -huh. and it's I, it's I, it's really re responding to uh, the creek level of course um, and then the red line in the deep well seems to be doing the same thing but a little bit later different sources yeah. well, the, Unless they're in different locations, they should reflect each other. They, they um, th this, um, you, you're talking about it like this right here. I I can't see the cursor, so I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm talking about the orange line. But the That's... orange line theory, yeah, that down there seems to be happening a little bit later than the. Yeah, it's it's a little bit uh, muted. The 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 response is a bit muted. Where this muted is more and more delayed. Direct. Yeah. Like 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 this this low for example mm -hmm. is 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 well we we don't really know where where the low is here because the well basically dried up. That's Mark, maybe maybe this is a perfect segue to get, yeah move forward to the H dating because I think that's going to give us a little bit um, yeah an idea also how fast the recharge or not is. Yeah, could you explain what you mean by the ancient water versus the current more modern? Yeah, water? yeah that's so. Yeah, all the all those questions we we want to take a this is this groundwater age dating is another way of looking at whether your uh, you, the the recharge uh, conditions of 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 that deeper aquifer, and yeah, so. I'll, I'll briefly, so each one of these methods, there's different methods to to age date modern water and pre-modern water. And then there's this paleo uh, climate in, indexes. And each one of these methods has a, has its own um, limitations and uncertainties. And so you really have to look at several different methods um, just just as the, the monitoring, they each have their own limitation, and you have to put the whole package together to 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 understand the response to the aquifer. And so, I, th I think I have some examples here. The pre-modern water really comes from this tritium. Um, it, it it comes 
uh, it it its name uh, came from from tritium levels, but but other other contaminants in aquifers pretty much since World War II, we we started using a lot of chemicals and above ground. You know, then we got in the Cold War and we. Um, we, we have this uh, atomic bomb testing uh, in, in the atmosphere. And um, so what happens with the, uh, with it, with the atmospheric testing of uh, atomic bombs um, is it, it produces tritium in the atmosphere at, at many orders of magnitude higher than baseline or pre pre bomb levels. Now, the pre bomb levels are down here by two, two mm. and eight, um, t- uh, that this is tr- tritium units, um, and so pre-bomb levels are down here, and we're we're now back to that tre- pre-bomb level, <clears throat> and now 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 we're starting this <laughs> side note. We're starting discussions, and and, and we're worried about the atomic bombs again. So may, maybe mm-hmm. we'll get some more age dating <laughs> data coming out. Um, but anyway, during during the '60s, it peaked. Um, the concentration of tritium in the atmosphere peaked, and it, it made so from the 1960s onward. There's this decay curve, and the mm-hmm. tritium decays at 12.32 years a half life. Um, so every 12.32 years, it's um, it's got half the amount left in the atmosphere, and um, so that's what this decay curve is, and so it was. It was an excellent dating, um, recharts dating um, uh, technique for most of the um, 70s and 80s and 90s, um, but it, it pretty much now we're we're at a mm-hmm. level that's um, that's background. So that, that's what we mean by pre-modern water. If if we draw a groundwater sample, um, so what happens is when when water in, recharges groundwater and i won't get too much detail on this but the the decay product or the daughter product of tritium decaying is is helium this h h h e 3 trit this is um so if you have water that uh, recharged the aquifer back in the 70s and it's been in the aquifer since since the 70s it's also decaying in the aquifer and producing tri- um, helium, um, and and that's that can be backed out, and that's that's this uh, a, a technique that we can use to extend this method. We can we can add back in the the tritium um, the, the the helium concentrations in the dissolved helium gas in the groundwater. We can measure that and then add that concentration back in to 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 um, estimate uh, the re- the recharge year U- using this method of of tritium. Um, there are other methods too, uh, but but that that was a main method for a long time, uh, very useful and main and that's where the pre modern water came from. But but there's other contaminants like CFCs. That's chlorofluorocarbon, and, and so that's um, that's re- from refrigeration. And during the '90s, oh, you know, here I have a plot of that. Um, I won't get into that. So CFCs um, during the '90s, you know, the the, the Montreal Protocol um, put put a um, put limitations on the use of of CFCs, and so it's we have this this concentration curve in the atmosphere, which we can use to to date groundwater. And it 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 peaked out during the '90s, 2000s, and it really hasn't declined much. It's a pretty stable um, uh, uh, compound. Same with SF uh, SF6 is um, uh, uh, sulfur fluoral hex, hex, hexafluoric sulfate, so, something like that. Uh, okay. Anyway, this is used in. Uh, pardon me. Sulfur hexafluoride, maybe. That yeah. Uh, could be yeah um anyways sf6 is used in uh, electronic um switches and it is a synthetic chemical um and its concentration is also rising that's this blue curve and so it it can be used too to as, as a tracer and it's, it keeps on it's there's 
there's no in fact there's more use with with the, the more electronic el electrical switches and mm -hmm. and electrical cars and more 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 elect electricity is being um used and so like they all need switches and and actually this is one of the it's probably the highest um there it's it's very low concentrations but it's um parts per trillion um but it's also one of the highest um uh uh, glo global warming um, chemical, M much I mean, orders of magnitude more than than CO two. Huh. Uh, um, so it's 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 a concern of for that reason, but it's it's used for dating, and this is a, a way uh, we used we used it in the Alta Vista well. Um, we got these concentrations, and you see where they plot. And it, in the background here, we show this is. Uh, rainfall years, departure from mean annual, and it shows the recharge years and the so most likely these these chemicals are getting recharged during these these high uh, recharge years where the departure is highest. And we talked about some of that. The, you know, two, um, 1982 and three. This is 1998, um, and so on. And and so we have these con we use these concentrations to date the recharge um and and that's that's another method of modern water meaning uh you know s since the 40s and 50s um in any older water um let me get back to this sorry older pre-modern water is like carbon 14 you probably heard of that um, for a, a lot of, it's it's used for thousands of years. There's this big gap. Um, the pre-modern water really goes back decades, but then the pre-modern water is like hundreds to thousands of years. There's radiogenic helium, um, which is uh, HU4. And it's, if if groundwater sits in a basin for long enough, it, it, it accumulates radiogenic helium um, from the decay of th thorium and, and and you know, from 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 the mantle basically um so so that's another method of this pre pre groundwater and and then real briefly paleoclimate indicators so the the these are two methods to indicate whether there the the groundwater re, the groundwater is um seems to come from a, from an earlier time when, when like they're, they're in the glacial maximum or shortly after the glacial maximum it would be thousands of years old you, you can you can these paleoclimate indicators which is um 018 these are stable isotopes of water and then uh recharge temperature this is this comes from this um noble gas um, um the the I, oh, I won't get into that detail. It's another, but it's just an, 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 another method of of looking at things. Um, so, getting back to the results, okay, this is going back to this is like a master table, um, and you're you're gonna love some of this. There's conditions. We talked about the conditions, the rainfall and the pumping conditions. Responses to the aquifer are are these the monitoring conditions and the the this is the the stream gauges. And this, these are the shallow monitoring wells. That's the the most important responses. And then, then the indicators would be um, these pre-modern and and modern water um, results. We we don't do this every year. It's just during these these key years, like when we when we saw this red flag here, and and the red here is showing what we just talked about with those plots. Basically, Montera. Montera Creek, oops, sorry, that backed up. M Montera Creek um, flowed very little um, during these extreme dry years. I mean, during 2014, the, the, and this is, oh, sorry, uh, this is the, the water year and these are showing drought levels and this is the uh, you know, wet year, dry year sequence. Um, so there's a lot of numbers here, but the red red ones are the, uh, the important things here, the, the important numbers to to look at because um it shows where it's it shows where there's a response that's of concern um and what's concerned here montero creek basically di didn't flow i think it flowed five days during 2014 mm -hmm. um and the as you as we looked at the 
water levels in monitoring well um, one and two went dry. So those those it it, it breached those thresholds that we were watching for um, for drawdown. The riparian didn't we we didn't we didn't uh, measure any riparian parameters, but we did look when we were there, and there was it, it didn't appear to um, be stressed, meaning it, it didn't discolor or wilt or um, drop leaves. Those those kind of additions were we 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 didn't monitor them, but but we did um, watch for that, um, but. Uh, so this shows that, and so what happened with the the modern water? Um, this shows the results of modern water methods. Um, this is the helium CFCs, and it's showing the recharge year. And what happened during 2014? The recharge year it pulled in older modern water, so the water level was lowering in in Alta Vista well. They were pumping it more, and when it and when it got lower, it pulled in older modern water. But also we saw carbon fourteen present, so it was pulling in um, pre modern water as well. In pre previous years and after that, um, carbon fourteen was absent, and radiogenic helium was absent. And and it's um, it's it continued to be um, d during this. Remember this second dry extreme dry period, twenty twenty and twenty twenty one. We saw conditions not quite as bad, but it's still uh, not bad. Not, bad's not the right word, but um, uh, uh, just uh, noting that the the Montero Creek didn't flow very much, uh, very little actually, and the the downstream. Is this no monitoring well too dried up, which is more shallow? Um, so we're seeing um, lowering water levels, but carbon 14 was absent, which it was present during this time, and the recharge year was um, a 10, 10 year old water. Um, so the, the modern water indicator, the, the helium showed that it was pulling, that it was drying. Uh, modern water of, of of ten years old, and recharged ten years, and uh, no pre-modern water. Now, are, are okay. You question. In order to increase our resilience for many dry years, maybe to come, would you suggest that we continue looking for other wells and continue our drilling? Hmm. Uh, in other words, when you started. In, in initially focusing on 12 different spots and you stopped at the fourth because you found a well that was very productive. Yep. Is it appropriate for us now to think about drilling eight more points to see if we can find further support wells? Do you think those are necessary? I, th I, th I think that's, a, that's an on ongoing objective. Uh, wouldn't you say so, Clemens? Yeah, I mean, we have um, not let go of this uh, because we use this knowledge that we gained through through here. I, I want to just highlight how important this presentation is, right? Because, uh, you know, this is something that you won't see with other water agencies. It's such an in-depth look of the health of our aquifer. Uh, if, if, if you would look at the, the draft um, with the drawdowns, and you know you would you would see actually uh, and you would you would look at the information that we had let's say in 2015. It, you know we we were looking at uh, a more concerning um, chart, right? If, if, if there would only be drawdown, right? There is there is very little recovery in it, right? So we we are now seeing how this aquifer is actually recovering and how it is behaving over a longer period, right? and how we manage it. But to answer your question, um, yeah, I mean, that is what we're doing. So for example, we have um, drilled our Patola well number three to a depth where we understand that it is actually tapping into uh, similar uh, waters. And um, we are, uh, this board has authorized also the um, uh, drilling of the Portola one well deeper, 
we actually already drilled Portola 4 well um, to a, to that depth where we understand that we are um, uh, getting into that uh, water bearing zone that's that's uh, further down um, at seawater level. And uh, that well unfortunately collapsed uh, when we were drilling it, but we were actually we were authorized funds to clean this out. So we're, we're just getting the permits for all of this work. We, we have not let go of the exploration, but we switched the focus on maybe a cheaper approach because we have, we understand, we have some wells that are suitable to tap into the same aquifer. Clement, could you explain the difference in cost between drilling an existing well deeper, because we already know it has some water and, and the chances of getting more deeper are better, versus starting fresh with a brand new well? Yeah, so it's for, millions of dollars. So, for example, uh, when we when we take the a, a very expensive redrill like the Portola Four that collapsed. Um, we're gonna spend, you know, we already spent uh, about fifteen thousand uh, dollars on this well. Now we have to come back with potentially better drilling te uh, technology. Um, uh, but we're gonna run into some additional cost, and I'm just gonna throw a number out that we are looking in the end uh, at maybe fifty, sixty thousand dollars to get that well into that shape that we want it to be uh and that versus uh the alta vista well uh, and we're talking now 2007 numbers at roughly a million dollars so that's kind of the price difference that we see new versus existing greg has his hand up i don't know if i'm gonna ask him uh, let's go to greg what question is are we drilling more wells, like putting more straws into the same glass of water, or are we getting new aquifers? So I'm, I'm unclear on how we determine that. And it relates to the question Clemens raised earlier. All these wells that are the Department of Public Health has got data on, are they also draining our aquifer? And do we have competition you know, there that we need to worry about. So I, I guess I'm worried about whether we're getting it. new sources of water or just adding more straws to the same drink. Well, the Alta Vista well is is a new source of water re relative to the other, um, to, to the, the airport uh, area is a one type of source. Um, yeah, but within the, within the granite fractured aquifer on the mountain, I understand the airport wells, and the Portola wells, there, there are others, but within the, the watershed we're dealing with here around Alta Vista, are we just adding more straws to the same drink or are we actually finding new sources of water? Um, yeah, that's, it really depends on where the well is. Um, there is um, certainly, uh, um, there is certainly an opportunity or not opportunity, but, um, a possibility of, of well interference. Um, I'll give you one example, um, what I mean by that. I'll pull up this. Um, one of the, so we drilled Alta Vista well, and uh, we also cited this well. We cited the well here, and they're, they're all along, we cited them along this this fracture zone or this, this orientation. And so this is one of our monitoring wells, and we're seeing this, um, and we set this up to to drill deeper, and we we're drilling these two wells at the same time. And when we, uh, you know, uh, when we found that Alta Vista well um, in intersected that deep joint, we stopped drilling this. But but it's it's sitting there; it could be drilled deeper. But now that we've been monitoring it, we um, see that it responds. Um, directly with uh with the alta vista well as pumping the alta vista well so if you were to drill this deeper and start pumping it there there would there would most likely be um or most certainly be it's some kind of in interference between those two i, I want to follow up on this uh answer and, and be maybe a little bit more direct i mean mark uh, at the very beginning um 
uh, started out that we are actually also looking at our quality. Um, uh, so when when we're drilling, when we're pumping, we're we're looking at the chemistry of the water. How's the composition? And so that gives us also an indication on is this similar? Are we potentially in the same aquifer? Yes or no? And the indications here are that we are in the same aquifer. So Greg, what I think Mark is talking about that we have a, a number of different aquifers that are clearly not related. Like for example, the airport aquifer, uh, we have a number of wells there that are clearly interfering or are in the same aquifer. Um, but we have other uh, wells that are also relatively shallow, right? So the airport, right. airport aquifer is 100 feet, goes roughly 100 feet down. We've also, in, in, in the district, in other areas, wells are going to similar depths, right? So we're talking about aquifers that are sitting on top, or are perched on top of the bedrock, right? So that are in um, alluvial fan deposits or weathered granite. Um, and, and, and so those have similarities, but are not connected. But the uh, straw, if you so want, um, let's say the Portola 3 well straw, uh, is, um, it is, is there's, there is definitely some interconnectivity between uh, that and the Alta Vista well. But uh, we still have a big advantage by increasing our source portfolio because we the Alta Vista well is you, and the Portola 3 are essentially now the two straws going in. If the Alta Vista well, well uh, has some trouble, we need some alternative ways of accessing that, the water from that area. If the Portola 3 well has some trouble, we need an alternative source. So we can look at the Portola 4 or the Portola 1 well that's relatively close uh, as an alternative source to that. So in short, I think what we're seeing here is that we're not trying to increase the overall pumping rates. Um, we're trying to increase the um, way how we can react to droughts and other situations uh, that, that, that require us to you know, do, do some thinking and, and, and find alternatives to produce the same amount for it. So Clemens, the Portola 4 is the one that collapsed. Why is Parkwell inactive? Parkwell is inactive because it's essentially um, directly adjacent to Montera Creek and it's under the influence of the surface water there. I see. It's not, a, it's not suitable as a well. Yeah. Water but, quality, you mean? Yep. Yeah, it's basically surface water. Let, let's go to Bill. Thanks. It seems at the moment there are three questions on the table. One is what do we do in case of drought? One is what do we do in case of a well failure or collapse? And one is whether we are sustainable. The question that I was hoping most to understand is sustainability, which was the title of the presentation. And based on just the graphs I've seen, it seems to me that, so the ultimate well started pumping in blue over at the left, Things drop by 50 or 100 feet and then it bounced around according to well rate. And then it settled back down to about 50 feet below where it started. So it seems to me from that graph that the water level is 50 feet lower now than it was 20 or so years ago when we started pumping that thing, which means that our pumping has an effect. And the fact that there's a back and forth of the uh, blue and the greenish yellow lines also shows the pumping has an effect. So it seems to me that sustainability question is already answerable on this graph because we are capable of pumping the Alta Vista well fast enough that it just drops the ground off. I don't think we need another straw because this big straw is big enough to drop the ground level below where we really want it to be. So it seems the sustainability question is already answered here. Obviously, if that if the Alta Vista well collapses, we need another. So. Question of collapse is something, but in drought, if our pumping fast from Alta Vista is reducing the water level that fast, that's going to be true in a drought and not in a drought. If we are already pumping Alta Vista level faster than it can handle, that's the answer we want to know right now. 
And then we can decide whether we want more wells which are capable of adding it. But I think I see the answer already about sustainability. I'm not sure I mean anymore. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, we seem to, you know, this is a well that can do hundreds of gallons a minute, and we, we're reaching a sustainable level. Oh, here, I'll pull that up. That I, I don't have it in the presentation, but yeah, um, there is this. Let's see if I can summary table. Is that, no, sorry. I've got this, this Zoom thing that gets, that gets interfered with. While Mark is looking, I, I think you're right. I mean, it shows the sustainability, but it also shows that if we would not manage the aquifer properly, we would be in trouble. Oh, yeah. That's, that's and exactly. by the way, the initial 50 feet, just forget about the initial 50 feet because, um, you know, to, to start pumping, you just immediately draw down to a pumping water level. Okay. And so you see the difference between a standing water level and a pumping water level. That's what the 50 feet is. So just to try. Okay, okay. So sustainability has more subtleties than I thought. Got it. Right, yeah. So this this is the the long term. You basically, I, I I have another one that's updated for 23, but it's it's not open right now. But 110 gallons a minute is basically the long term pumping rate. Oh, okay, cool, perfect. Of, of that well, and, and we're capable of doing 300. That that. No. We no, we it's... Don't. well, it's not permanent for that. Oh, oh, okay. So, and and there's a reason we have, in addition to what you see here, we have conditions on our water plan and our coastal permit regulatory stuff, which are in there to protect our groundwater and our sustainability. So it, it's it's very simple to say, oh, we could pump 300 gallons a minute. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we have regulators and good scientists who are protecting us from ourselves. The first thing is what the ground will give us next is what the regulators will give us. And what's well, proven no, to take out? No, the regulators try to give us what 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 their the science and knowledge informs us. Thank you. And that's but why this is, this is why the regulators are are keen on paying attention to what the, the limitations of the physical world so that that ambitious people don't and just, that's why we're learning excuse me bill I'm, yes. excuse me let me let me talk okay this is why we've been very supportive of the kind of uh uh, input that the Coastal Commission and their team had and the Regional Water Quality Control Board, uh, the, the state water, <clears throat> they're attentive to these things as well because they've seen they've seen uh, agencies go wrong in their ambition and uh, the level of detail. I, I love this longitudinal study. This shows us uh, many things. I think one of the takeaways that I'm, I picked up on tonight for the first time is if you if if you're not careful, you deprive the roots of your riparian uh, of water, and the riparian dies. And getting that back is going to be really hard and take a very long time, if at all. Especially if rains wash away all the soil that they were growing in. So this is that's a really interesting mark. I really appreciate that you pointed out the the yellow flag on that because that's. <laughs> If you're not watching, uh, it could completely go by you, and then all of a sudden you're wondering why, why all the willows are dead. So I really appreciate uh, the insight that you're giving us on this. Uh, how are we doing on time, Mark, in terms of how, yeah. how much more you've got? I, I've I got two more slides here, um, uh, it, and uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up um, if if that's okay, what? unless if, you want you I want to cut it off here. Quickly. It'll, say that no. again? No. Go look at the Central Valley where they say Mother Nature rules. The wells are now 500 feet. They started out at 300 feet, and the ground level is sinking, and they're running out of water in the Central and Valley. They were paying attention to this kind of thing? They were paying attention to the water that was flowing. They were not paying attention to this. That's why your frivolous statement about Mother Nature rules. No, it was not frivolous. It was very frivolous. It was not. So let's let's move let's, on. Right, go yeah, ahead, let, 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 let me just show uh, this. This is the quantitative check. This is kind of like a, a the calc one of the calculations or modeling. Um, so this is uh, like, kind of like a reverse um, look at things. If if you assume um, 
an annual recharge of eight inches, six inches, and four inches. This is kind of like uh, four inches, six inches. For, for your area, it's probably more like eight inches. You know, for, uh, deep groundwater recharge, th these are common numbers. Uh, four inches, um, eight inches, and six inches. Okay, and if you take your annual groundwater pumping, we looked at that total is 110 acre feet. This is long-term pumping. So what, what, what does that mean in terms of the recharge area? Um, and so if you estimate the recharge area based on, based on 110 uh, um, gallons, uh, the recharge area of 110 gallons, um, if, if, it, if, there, if, uh, if it recharges eight inches, would be 165 acres. And if it's six inches, you, get, you need more acres. Four inches, you need you know, twice as much as, as eight. And so it, this, if you were, and then if you were to express these values of recharge area as a percent of the topographic watershed above the well, basically um, expressing it in terms of surface water shed um, to the well. Now this is this is just a it's just an, a check. It's not because a groundwater shed is is different than the surface water shed. But for recharge, your areas, uh, we looked at that photo, it, it, it are these colluvial wedges and, and alluvial valleys are really the, the main recharge areas. So if you look at that, that recharge area, uh, which happens to be 360 acres of topographic recharge watershed above the well, um, this, this value, this area, is expressed as 48% of the recharge area. And if it was, if it was six inches, it'd be 60%. And then if it was four inches long-term, it would be 92% of the recharge area. So you're, you're within a, a, a qualitative um, level of um, a comfortable level for, for a qualitative um, check of this. Meaning okay. if... If these values were, you know, 200 or 300, saying saying that you're you're like way over the recharge area, the estimated recharge area, then then that that would be a, a, a real concern. The fact that you're under, and most likely you're under by 50 percent, um, is it, it kind of go goes along with the sustainable. What what is sustainable? You you want to be you want to be less than um, the amount of water that, that, that can be recharged, you know, physically. I assume we're eight. I don't know which of those is our normal. Uh, say that again. Which eight, six, or four, which is closer to what we actually get at rainfall? Eight. Eight is probably Thank closer. You. Okay, got it. Because of the, the, the deeply weathered, non-glaciated conditions that you have. Um, it's, it's probably more like eight inches of recharge uh, on a long-term basis. Um, so then if, if you want to look at uh, another perspective, a completely different perspective, which would be to, to look at what, you know, what, what, what are the farmers saying, the long-term farmers? And in your area, there's, 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 there's none of that. Um, uh, you want to talk to the, the, the old residences and, and, and people who, the, the homesteaders, and and what what did they pump at and and how 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 is your level um how, how does it work out um and so what i looked at is this in indigenous traditions um which, which comes from from gratitude and a uh, capacity for reciprocity and, and and a caring capacity um and this is like a different different perspective and i i pulled some of this from um from from a book um called let me get this out of the way um oh, what's the name of this book sorry um it's a indigenous book that's um braiding sweetgrass i don't know if anybody has read that it's uh, i'd really recommend it it's basically um a, a botanist who, who who's also indigenous and she's like crossing science with in indigenous traditions, and this is this is um, 
what she put together from a lot of their their legends and myths and and um, approaches of of how to manage um, uh, harvesting, you know, hunting and gathering, and how it, what's what's the best way to to um, sustain. And so I I kind of took this list and and applied different ways of looking at this. Um, from from a sciencey perspective, and w- one of their mm. their guidelines is to never take more than half. You know, leave some for others. Mm. And so that was just that recharge estimate that we just looked at. If it's eight inches recharge, you're you're basically taking about half of the water that's that's being recharged within your recharge area. And so it's kind of following this this honorable harvest uh, perspective. Um, which is a completely different way of, of thinking about it, but um, it's it's interesting. Take only what you need. And so this is like the master plan updates that you're doing and uh, assessing your demand and uh, outlooks and 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 basically and answering the questions that you were just asking uh, about you know how many, how many new wells do we need? Mm-hmm. Um, you know you, you, you take what you need. Um, harvest in a way that minimizes harm. That's the, C- the CEQA compliance. So we, you, go, you go through CEQA and you set up a monitoring program like we we uh, we did, and you you comply to it. You you look at you know you don't want to um, pull down the water level below root zones, um, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't want to Im- impact neighbors. Know the ways of the ones who take care of you. Um, so in terms of the groundwater, you just un- understand the framework. And so we're, we're on, on track of understanding the framework and the monitoring across uh, wet years and dry years. That's, that's knowing, knowing the ways of, of, of your aquifer. Or the, or, and your aquifer is the source that, take care, that takes care of life. It's a source of life. Um, and so you're taking care of the, what's, what's taking care of you. Um, uh, be accountable and uh, abide by the the answers that the, the the responses to the aquifer, and this is the adaptive management that we're, we we just went through, and so we're kind of following similar similar um, ways of of the uh, in, of indigenous traditions. Um, use it respectively. Um, you know, conserve. You have conservation programs. You you have uh, meetings um, locally, and ne- never waste what you have taken. Uh, you know, recycling. We, we, uh, one of the things we're ta- um, that's been talked about um, is, and and it's becoming more popular in California is MAR um, managed aquifer recharge, Get, getting more water, um, spreading more water on onto the alluvium, and 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 getting it into the ground, um, and giving thanks of of what you've been given. And so that's, that's I saw a lot, a lot of that in the in the 65th anniversary celebration you all had. There was a lot of uh, thanks to um, the people and the uh, the the um, the the place you live. Um, and then finally, sustain the ones who sustain you, and the earth will last forever. So that's that's all, uh, and, and that's that's probably the the bottom line to what sustainability is all about. Um, anyway, Thank you. That's, Thank you. That was great. That's uh, so it, it it does look like you're you're managing the Alta Vista well in a uh, in a habitat responsive adaptive management uh, way um, for the, a very comp- complicated and complex um, condition. Thank you, Mark. That was terrific. Um, it is. It's uh, <laughs> it's kind of good to see behind the curtain and and see just how much goes into. Oh, look, Alta Vista well is working. You know, it's uh, it's not just a great well, but to to know so much about what happens uh, that you just can't see from standing there and looking at it, but but we can wind up seeing because you and the team give us visibility into this this is terrific and over such a long period of time too um i, I take it this was well received at the conference um i th- i think so i i actually you know uh, maybe uh maybe maybe um 
um, Clemens can answer that question. Yeah, it, it was, was it was it was hard for me as a presenter to to really um, see how people responded. I, 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 I do I do say there there are a lot of um, requests for the, this uh, PowerPoint. That's yeah. great. That's... There must be a lot of water districts that just rely on Hetch Hetchy and never bother to go out and try to find their own or mm -hmm. develop a responsible extraction. Uh, let's go to Catherine. Uh, I will add that one of the reasons this board is so careful and responsible is because the county allowed between El Renata and Montero over 300 wells, not knowing the proximity of one to another. Many people still rely on those wells. They don't have their water tested and they don't know whether their wells will work in a drought or not. They're very lucky that this district has the resources to be able to accommodate them. But that's because of the county's attitude that nature will take care of itself. <laughs> and um, we need to be very, very careful about this. There, were, there are people in Moss Beach who in the early 2000s had their wells go dry. There are houses that were built and I don't know if they've been remedied or not, where they had two underperforming wells combined to be able to build one house. Those are the kinds of things that our dear, delightful, responsible county is settled this district with. And we need to be very careful to make sure of them. And, and those people don't understand exactly what the hazards are that they have. And many of them have decided not to connect to this system. Um, we do have water available for them, but it will come at a connection fee now. Um, we, used, for some years, gave people an opportunity to tie into um, our, our system at a discount, but that has gone. Do we give these people our information about groundwater levels so they know what situation they're in? This meeting is public and all of the materials are on our website. So, and quite yes. possibly groundwater levels vary throughout a district. It's not a flat lake. Yeah. So groundwater levels can be different 10 feet from each other. In my neighborhood, there's an earthquake fault going through. I've got a good well. My neighbors across the street, their well will not produce. Hmm. It's, it's all very location specific. Okay. All right. That's a good point about the earthquake. Um, that changes conditions. Um, a big earthquake can um, be be a problem for these deep wells. Uh, let's go to uh, Greg. I just wanted to ask uh, if we could get a copy of the report that underlies this, and then I wonder what this is going. This information is going to do in updating the. Uh, water management plan for the district when when is that going to be uh taken into account i know you have a 2017 plan document um i can safely say that by mid-summer the latest we're going to have an updated master plan hopefully before then and the reports on the agenda uh yeah uh, mark uh I think there were some extra slides that you showed, so maybe we can get a copy to this for you that we can put in the minutes mm -hmm. of the poll. Yeah, I think you're asking about the, uh, there's an updated report coming. Um, it's pending. We did take some samples um, recently, and the, the, we were pending some results, um, you know, following this, uh, this, re this past wet year. And then we were, we're going to put together a, an updated report. Okay, so um, we are well into the meeting. We're two hours in from the start. So uh, last question, Sid? Uh, Mark, what about, I mean, maybe you haven't done any surveys south of here, but I've heard some of the wells further down, like in Miramar and parts of Athens, they do have saltwater intrusion. Is that just a urban myth or is that they have problems there further south? Yeah, I there. If if you have a well close to very close to the coast, I could see uh, it 
it pulling salt. Thank you. There, 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 there are those. Um, but I, I'm, I'm mostly focused on on your wells, and you. um, and I'm not seeing any seawater intrusion from the rates that you pump. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, always great to hear from you, and it's. Uh, I hope those of you watching uh, get some appreciation for uh, some of the magic that happens. Uh, and just, you know, Mark's not uh, working in a vacuum. He he works very closely with Clemens and and others. And so this this is all part of the organizational knowledge that goes into the kind of things that wind up as recommendations here at the board table. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, We've got more on the agenda, so we're going to move on to uh, the next item, review June 30, 2023 fiscal year end audit budget versus actual. Yeah, thank you. Uh, standard item that was introduced by Peter uh, some years ago. Um, so I think we've been doing this now uh, at least six, seven years, uh, but the, um, uh, the, the mid-year budget, no, excuse me, fiscal end year end audit budget versus actual uh, is available. And I'm gonna just ask Peter to um, run quickly through through the presentation <laughs> see how many questions. Well, uh, that, that's that's extremely tough to follow. Um, you know, <laughs> go, listen to like, yeah, um, pretty mundane stuff we're gonna look at. So I won't go, go, go into depth for anything in particular, um, just basically just to, to kind of explain what this is, um, is on, on, on a month to month basis, basically you are looking at cash basis financials. Um, we close the month, but we're always about a month behind. Um, you may say, okay, well, how is this, this report far different from the June 30th report that we looked at in would be August. Um, and the answer is really just, just, just said at that point, we haven't gone through the close and the close really is um, capturing all the accruals, capitalizing all the items that, that, that were expensed throughout the year. Um, really just kind of nailing down the balance sheet to actuals. And through that process, a number of, of transactions um, are recognized through a journal entry. Um, and it's really just, just to basically uh, present the June 30th as a snapshot, um, which I said that, that really what that ends up doing from a uh, profit and loss, a revenue expense standpoint is that it recognizes more revenue and a lot more expenses. We capture all the accruals because it said that um, invoices that come in July, August, September um, are not seen on a month to month basis. They would just be capturing in that month that they took place. But when that happens, we look at them and say, okay, this work was performed in June or during that fiscal year. So we, we bring it all back. So that's kind of the, 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 the major context um what this really does is basically it 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 then either distorts or basically it brings it into focus how well we did on a budgetary basis because said we budget and a, we go through the budget process in january february march april of the full year before looking out you know 18 months so how well do we actually perform and so that's what the report you put you have in front of you is that now that the audit process has been completed we now compare that to how well we budgeted and they like said as you'll see like i said i'm, I'm i i can uh pull it up um you have the report there um maybe i will just kind of highlight kind of some major items but i said i'm not going to go go into each and every one of them um, if you don't mind, I will share my screen now. Just like I said, I promise to not talk uh, your guys' ears off because like I said um, I'm. It's interesting to me, but after that, going through the last one, uh, highly lacking um, in terms of of uh, depth and uh, <laughs> play on words. Okay, so but yes, yeah, so, so 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 what this report lays out is basically our budgetary view. Um, this was our adopted budget here with our actuals compared. And I said, this is done for both sewer and water. Uh, sewer first, basically the, the, the comparison to budget, the, the executive summary that I provided, basically I don't 
on a month-on-month -month basis, we go through $2,000 up or down for this one. I basically just capture everything. So I said, each one is kind of touched on. Um, so I said, that's, that's, that's how we view this uh, um, for this page. And then going on, we have the, the uh, year by year comparison compared to last year's actuals. And then after that, we go into the detail um, for every single account. We display everything that we budget for. This is our full GL um, and the actuals for the previous few years as well. So we go through that for both sewer and water. And afterwards, uh, we kind of get into uh, the other pieces that are basically the balance sheet discussion as far as capital assets, what, what we, we, these were items that were expensed throughout the year and then capitalized at fiscal year end. So $1.2 million. Um, and then, uh, accumulated depreciation of $1.5 million. So I said adding assets, not to the level that, that, that we are budgeting for, for various reasons. But I said, we, we continue to build our, our infrastructure. After that, we talk about debt. Um, this part, I think, is always kind of interesting and fascinating to see kind of how we how we're doing. Um, the big ones, I say, here we are. You know, uh, geo bonds, twenty twenty eight. We're going to be done with these, so five more years. Um, I bank. This is only one year away, so we're getting very close on a couple of these larger debt issuances. Um, this is the big one here, geo bond, August one, twenty twenty eight. Should be a party for that one. Um, <laughs> Peter, yeah. why why don't you have the balances on those? I do. Uh, oh, here. oh, somewhere else. Gotcha. Uh, I, see I see it. So, so yeah, the table really tell tells the story. Um, okay. This part I think is always you know, this question usually you know pops up once every couple of years as far as what are they going to be done? And so so I so, yeah. I so I just made it as part of you know this is the payoff date. So and then afterwards, just basically the discussion of how we did um, our cash performance as far as we set our reserve as far as a target. And then at the end of the year, based on all these transactions, how do we actually perform for both, for both the sewer, water, operating, and capital? So um, like I said, it's all there laid out for you guys. Like I said, this part is, is always interesting to me because I said, we, we, we look at it so far ahead and I mean, you know, the finance uh, uh, Clemens and I, um, Director Decker, other board members, um, we're, we're, we're looking at it from so many different angles and we're doing our best, but it's like, ah, it's just historical tells only so much with the pandemic, you know, handful of years, it made it very difficult. And so I said, just looking at it from this view and kind of after it's all been, um, reviewed compiled and then audited um so know that these are good numbers um i think it's always kind of interesting to kind of then show you guys say okay well this is how well we did or didn't do um sometimes i said we're just off there are things that come up that we do not anticipate that we can anticipate and then sometimes we anticipate moreover that that don't come to fruition kind of with the one thing here that i'll say is like for the last couple of years is that um we had anticipated that the redistricting was going to be i mean combined probably close to about three hundred thousand dollars and it did not come out to be there so when we budget these these figures they don't necessarily have packed our rates because that our rates are more or less kind of that that's a separate a, a separate item that is looked at you know in conjunction with our our operation but it's not as far as i say well you know we're we're budgeting uh, in the red and so we have to raise rates you know X amount of percent. That's not how we do it. Um, we that we really try to just nail down our expenses and keep them as low as possible. And but you know by still maintaining the the integrity of the system and all the parts of operations. So it's difficult. And so I said we sometimes I find that okay. Well, through that process, we've either kind of inadvertently funded our reserves. Um, but then I said all that money is into then that is available for future projects or for operations. But in terms of, you know, my mindset says that I think we do a pretty good job of really um, trying to, trying to capture what is reality and then, um, you know, not, not go overboard, but then also to you know, be conscientious that, um, you know, we, we, we know it's important as far as, 
um, the ongoing operation of the district and then, um, you know, just try to have that money to just for future projects. It really, what, what I'm trying to say is that everything's expensive and we know mm -hmm. that. And so budgeting for it is not always the easiest, but I said, I think we do a good job of it. So any questions? Peter, I have two, two comments. Yes. Um, I was able to look the, further into the audit and I found that on page 34, you have the wrong numbers for the cover employee payroll. I think what happened there is that the number was shifted by one year. So, Sorry, say what page? I have the 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 audit open as well. What page? Page thirty four. Thirty four. Okay, for the RSI, the required supplementary information. Yeah, the schedule of changes in the net position uh, in the net uh, pension liability and related ratios. Yes. Years under um, the covered employee payroll. Uh, the payroll for 2022, January 30th, 2022, should not be 830-879. That number belongs in the 22 column. And the 23 column should show 887-027, as you can see, when you go to the next page, 35. So that needs to be rectified. Um, the other thing is, um, I looked at the operating reserves um, in your presentation, and I see that they're still only at one third of what it, where they should be. Uh, that is uh, that is not good. Uh, what is good is that our uh, capital reserves are are uh, in in good water. They are uh, they are well. So uh, we have good news and we have bad news. Yeah. Now it's actually that funny you, you bring that up because as I you know kind of going through the October close. It's starting to come out more and more in the one worksheet that I show that shows the cash position month by month. Um, we're getting in that position to where both capital reserves on the water and sewer side base, not, which is something that like I said seven, eight years ago, we, we, we would not have thought would even be a conversation because um, I said that's just not where we were. Um, it is now that's changed, whereas I'm seeing the same thing as far as operating reserves are are not close and so i said figuring out what to do with it it's a discussion i said we're going to bring it up as we get into budget season as far as setting those reserves what are we going to do to fund them because i said there 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 are issues with it and you see anything with think of uh, the water reliability study or the, the water reliability charge that is a major factor of what's really pushing those water reserves. We, we, we've received that money. It's held off to the side. It's available for projects. Okay, well, now we need to start using the money, but it's not available for operation, and so we don't want to call it an operational reserves. So, you know, there, 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 are, there are items to figure out. Thank you. Thank you, Jager. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, I don't see any more comments or questions. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Peter, because clearly, clearly, uh, uh, this is a team effort, and but and Clemens as well. I mean, this is um, this is terrific stuff, and I really, really appreciate uh, the the cadence that you both have established in in bringing this because it it really helps us see on a more frequent basis. It's easier to get a sense of. Oh, hey! Something's changing, or something's holding steady. Uh, when it's when it's less frequent, it's much harder to pick those things up. So, thank you very much. Very welcome. All right, uh, let's go to reports. Sewer Authority Mid Coast Side. Anything? We had a finance committee meeting this morning, and we reviewed the uh, audit, and all is well in terms of the audits. The audit found the numbers to be reflecting uh, reality. And there were no major mistakes found, so it was all the news. Yeah. Good. I, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity. Uh, we don't do this every every meeting, but uh, work with the Sewer Authority Mid Coast Side represents a, a big time investment and a lot of uh, emotional energy and intellect and hard work, uh, both in the meetings and outside the meetings. And I just, having done that for many years myself, I know. Uh, you both are carrying quite a burden to do this, and I just want to take a moment and say thank you. 
Well, I'd like to add that on Saturday is the um, uh, open house at Sam. So everyone is invited to come. Um, the Board of Supervisors has very kindly given accommodation for every single employee at okay. Sam's. Uh, that was at my request because they did such an exemplary job for the last two years in protecting the public health of this community and keeping us as a viable community for all of us to live in. Had we lost that plant, we don't know where we would be. If we would be, all, every house here for the most part would be red tag. What did the supervisors give? I, I didn't get the exemption. Of commendation. I, I, that's good, I guess, but I don't know. Accommodation. They are, oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, commendation. I thought you said, okay. Four. Okay, let's, let's go to Sam. On the Sam meeting on Monday night, it was really, really difficult to hear on Zoom because I guess the L was muffled. Hmm. And I would just, I don't know. I couldn't even hear what you guys were saying, even when I put on the closed captioning. And then I thought, well, maybe the PCT picked it up and it wasn't any better on Zoom. I mean, uh, YouTube. So can you guys maybe make a suggestion that they go to recording live at their meetings again instead of this? That meeting, it was already uh, said by Kishin. Oh, good. They would change the situation. Oh, good. Yeah, that work. Thank God. I couldn't hear that even. <laughs> so especially yeah. the problem is. We have several agencies who don't want to pay extra. Yeah. And so um, that's a major concern for Sam is staying within the agency budgets. And it's only going to get worse, as you pointed out, with Half Moon Bay's um, financial process. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, I would, I I hope we can find a way. I have asked to have PCTV come back because I don't think it's all that expensive, but we will see what the other agencies say. And um, the other reason is because sometimes there's certain people in that meeting that over talk the other people while they're talking in it with the owl, it just whips back and forth hmm. and you can't see who's talking or what they're saying. And also when they're over talking each other, of course, it's hard to hear the different points of view. So, so I, I want to go back to the topic of the open house and just um, thank you, Catherine, for reminding me. Um, so down at the sewer authority mid coast uh, plant, which is a thousand North Cabrillo highway in Half Moon Bay, uh, starts at 10, runs to 2 p.m. That's this Saturday. And there will be a meet and greet with the directors and the staff. There will be plant tours. And uh, if you're not familiar with plant tours of the Sword Authority Mid-Coast side, uh, believe it or not, they get rave reviews. It's been a, a regular, with especially with the local schools. And the students seem to really look forward to uh, to those tours. It's very informative. And uh, the, the crew is just great at giving those tours. There will be beverages and snacks that will, uh, <laughs> and there will be games. So Saturday, 10 to two, uh, it'd be great to drop by, learn, learn a bit more about the, the people and the facilities that help make this place so livable. Children, children and dogs on leashes are welcome. And the children may not need to be on a leash, but <laughs> there are some, Serious area, so you may want to consider. Yeah. All right. Okay. So thank you. Let's uh, let's see. Do we have anything for the Mid Coast Council Community Council? Uh, Greg, we have a ton. I'm sorry to say, but I want to mm -hmm. bring up some important things before we go to the holidays. Piggybacking on Sam, we still don't have an explanation for the excess inflows through the pipes to the Sam plant in the last two Decembers. The reports that are being produced have explained the break in the pipes. Due to excess pressure in this December, they've explained uh, the overflow of the banks of the creek, but they haven't explained the excess inflows. That's something I hope that the MWSD representatives will uh, continue to pursue along with me and asking Sam to explain that. I think we all know what's going on there, but it needs to be analyzed in, and reported. Um, 
At the last meeting, you received uh, some comments from concerned parents about the school water shutoff. Hmm. I suggested post-mortem. I am pursuing a post-mortem. I've been uh, receiving excellent cooperation from Clemens and Sean McFetteridge. Um, and uh, where this is going, I think, is upstream to the question of who has what standards for notifying what parties about what's going on that did not occur. There was clearly a lack of notification to the MCC, for example, of the construction at Farrell and View and to MWSD. So I'm going to continue to follow that. And I'm also doing a pre-mortem. I reached out to GCSD and CCWD regarding the construction in the El Granada schools to try and avoid the same issues there. And Sean hosted a Zoom call, was it yesterday? All of us got together and talked about what the risks are working on something that hasn't been looked at for 60 years when you're remodeling it. One thing I would ask of MWSD, which would help us all, is to uh, publish the list, of, I'll call it the punch list of things that Clemens found uh, related to water and sewer on the school property. Uh, I understand there's jurisdictional issues. Maybe a MWSD responsibility stops at the meter. Okay, that's what the GS, GCSD people were implying when we talked about the El Granada schools. But I think it's very important to be able to give a list to the Department of State Architects and the County Public Health Department, and also to show the folks in El Granada what they might be up against, um, mm -hmm. and that they should do some rework discovery early. So I appreciate it if, if MWSD would publish some kind of summary of the things it found. Um, tomorrow, we're going on a tour of Montero Mountain with the state parks people to discuss the damage that was done with the road maintenance. There are a bunch of things that have been done sloppily by American Tower up there. Um, I don't think you need to know the details, but it, it somewhat relates to the San Francisco Public Utilities thing that we discussed some years ago. Also, we uh, have strong resident concerns about the use of pesticides in parks lands. Uh, we're going to be holding a forum with parks on January 24th. I'm unclear if there's any impact on the MWSD watershed, but I don't know what GGNRA does for weed and pesticide control. And then finally, I've undertaken a research on the flow of funds to the Midcoast to try and find out how much money we contribute to the county and how much gets spent here. Mm -hmm. I got one third of what I asked for, which was an estimate by the chief financial officer that the Midcoast contributes about a million three something like that, in property taxes uh, to the county. Which no, that, makes, makes, not, it, not, it, makes no sense at all. I have I have the assessment reports from MWSD and GCSD. My own estimate is we contribute $42 million, of which uh, about 41% after you take out the schools and the other stuff would be free and clear. The reason I bring this up is I'm going to be lobbying for a general manager or assistant general manager for the Mid-Coast. I don't think the Mid-Coast is getting its share of priority money. We're not being listened to in Measure K. We're not even getting updates on things we've written letters asking for during this year. So I think we need much stronger staff administrative capacity at the county level. Um, and I think it's justified if I can substantiate the tax flow. What I would ask of the district is I will pass out my report to you guys. And if any of you know something about property tax flows before I write back to the chief financial officer and disagree with them, I would <laughs> like to understand what possibly I don't know uh, so that I have a solid case uh, that I'm making for the flow of funds and investment. Sorry to be so long, but happy holidays to everybody. Thank you. Question. Any questions? Yes, my, I have a question for you. I, I was there in person and uh, Supervisor Mueller zoomed in and he quickly mentioned that he was going to give Measure K money to the Midcoast, but he said something sounded like, well, he's not going to really give it to the Midcoast because the county has to keep control of it or something. So I don't, he didn't mention a dollar amount, but the, the deadline is coming up for asking for Measure K funding. And I don't. So I attended the seminar, said I attended the seminar yesterday or earlier this week that they had. The MCC cannot receive Measure K monies because it is not a financial repository of funds. It's just an advisory board. We can't even fill out the forms. I've asked, how can we provide the information? As you know, we're capable of producing 40 to 70 page reports. Mm -hmm. um, 
Ray has made several good responsive comments, but I have nothing in writing. I have no plan. I have nobody assigned and I have no detailed status reports. And I no do know, money. I haven't made this public yet, but I do know that the county has blocked our request for a feasibility study for the community fiber. And I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm going to let Half Moon Bay Review plumb into that. We really need more attention to our priorities. And I think some of them are justified. And that's all I'll say at this time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, uh, the council is very busy. Um, and, and thank you, Greg, for all of your work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, Catherine, uh, CSDA. CSDA is getting reorganized. Jim Pruitt, general manager of the uh, Harbor District, is now reorganizing the local CSDA San Mateo County chapter and has set out a request for availability for meetings in December. So we will see. Uh, LAFCO met yesterday, and their major topic of discussion was turning the East Palo Alto Sanitary District, which is an independent special district, into a subsidiary of East Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. um, in talking to folks at um, on LAFCO, I suggested that they needed to put in some financial controls because I have noticed that often subsidiary districts funding gets moved into general funds and uh, the purpose of a special district is then defeated. Hmm. Nice. Uh, very good. Thank you. Uh, Christine, anything for the attorney's report? No report. All right. Any director's reports? No hands up. Uh, general manager's report? I just want to echo a little bit what uh, Greg just said uh, about the school. Uh, so the response that we are getting right now is excellent. Um, very good communication with Kabir uh, Unified School District. Uh, the two-inch um, backflow device that we requested was put in on Friday to allow us to open up. And uh, the six-inch we ran into some or school that we're asking to install. The school ran into some trouble installing the six-inch, um, some, some complications. Uh, but there is an existing single check that's taking care of that line. Uh, so that will be upgraded to the um, required reduced pressure device that's above ground. Uh, we're going to give plenty of time to do the work and sort out the snags that can be expected. Um, and that will be done over the winter holidays. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, Anything for future agendas? Okay, we are going to thank our public for uh, joining us. Thank you, uh, Peter, and uh, Mark's already gone, but we sure do appreciate uh, the good help that we get from our, our specialists. We're going to go into, uh, we're going to take a break and let PCT uh, tear down, and then we're going to reconvene in closed session. We'll be discussing City of Half Moon Bay versus uh, the other districts and uh, two potential cases of anticipated litigation. That is what's on the closed close session agenda. And if we take any action, we will report that uh, when we come out of closed session. Thank you everyone for joining us and we are now in recess. Oh. Oh.